Good morning. Welcome to the third Sunday of Advent. Our series during the four weeks of Advent focuses on uh, announcing the story of God's new day, announcing the way, today shifting to light, announcing the light, and next Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Advent, announcing God's might. On this third Sunday in Advent, the Advent candles have a little different wrinkle. This is seen as a sort of special day, a pause in the four weeks. And on the third Sunday of Advent, the last candle lit is the rose-colored candle. It is the candle for joy, and Rosemary will light two blue candles and finish the third uh, candle lit will be the rose candle. Roberta will read about joy. I've been reminded recently that our church has often collected uh, calendars, 2021 calendars, right Karen? Am I on, correct me if I'm off base here. And uh, they may come from various agencies or organizations, and if they're more than you can use, uh, feel free to get them to the church office, and then we can have a sort of clearinghouse where others could come and get them for 2021. A word about our giving. I want to offer some real encouragement and, again, speak from my heart in appreciation. Uh, It's been a tough time. We know this is a tough time. I I feel as if I say it a lot, and I apologize if it sounds like I do. But I also want to let you know that we're hanging in there as a congregation, and we're getting good ministry done, and folks are supporting this ministry. And I'm grateful, as well as others in the church who are helping to organize uh, what that giving does. So thank you. It's certainly important. We continue to need that commitment as we go forward, especially in the pandemic with all the uncertainty. Uh, but thank you. Uh, please hear that. I attribute the fact that we are moving ahead strongly to three things. This is just your pastor's heart. Number one Uh, Those of us who are responsible for managing church finances are being pretty darn careful. We are uh, spending things uh, as we need to, to be wise and to handle the items that do require attention. But we're also being very careful and very efficient, I think. And so we've watched our spending in terms of uh, close stewardship and care. Secondly is the generosity of folks. In addition to that careful stewardship of the resources, uh, we have a lot of uh, careful personal and family stewardship of resources that are, quote, out there in our uh, lives and community. And the giving from those resources has been generous. The third thing that I do want to mention, though, is that as a part of this, is our congregational generosity and service and mission. We have not curtailed our serving of others and our hard work, especially when so many are struggling with unemployment and other kinds of uh, issues, especially food uh, insecurity or scarcity, folks who need food. We have, in my mind anyway, stepped up our efforts in terms of participation of folks in many of our uh, area ministries. So that's a really powerful combination, being careful with resources, giving generously, and third, uh, serving generously and boldly. So I'm, it's, a, it's a very satisfying thing, and I'm proud of what this congregation does through a tough time, so thank you. On that note, we have the benefit in December of having Karen Benedicts as our liturgist with us in the worship service. Karen also serves as the president of Action Ministries, and I would hate to let an opportunity go for her to maybe say just a quick word about Action Ministries before she calls us to worship. So thanks, Karen. Good morning. I just wanted to let you know that we served 47 families this morning. 
Um, Deb Cahill, the director of nutrition services at the school, prepared a turkey dinner, and all of the clients were served as a takeout, a turkey dinner today, and it worked wonderfully well. It was such a blessing. I'm so happy that she did that. And uh, the other thing is, I'd like to let you know that we've added another mobile food truck to our agenda for December. December 22nd, it's a Tuesday. It will be held at the fire department, and I really could use some volunteers. So if you have nothing to do the week of Christmas, uh, maybe you could come and help us for a couple hours. We'll be inside so it won't be quite as cold. Thank you. So Karen, the, the um, mobile pantry on the 22nd, if we meet at the fire station about 3.30ish, it starts, we get rolling with the, the sharing of the food at about four. Right. So folks should call you, right? Yes, please. Okay, I just wanna make Sorry. sure I'm not leaving you in a lurch there. Okay, if you could call us to worship then, that would be great. Please join me in the call to worship. In the midst of darkness, God brings a new light. Thanks be to the God of light. In the midst of confusion and fear, God brings us joy. Thanks be to the God of joy. In a society that lives in shadows of blame and hatred, God gives us light. Come and worship the God who brings light to the world. Our opening hymn this morning is O Come All Ye Faithful. I believe you have the words at home, so you won't bother anybody. Sing loud. <laughs> Joy, maybe, but let's be honest. This year has been stressful. A bruising national election, the pandemic, joy? Do we have to feel joy? Isaiah says that God has declared good news in the face of poverty and brokenness. God will give the oil of joy in place of mourning. We don't have to keep up appearances or manufacture happiness. We can let go and live in real joy. We light the candles of hope.
and love and joy to show us the way. Come, let us live in God's light that we may learn the ways of hope and love and joy. Please join me in the prayer. God who dispels all darkness, come be with us in each situation of our lives. Come live among us and in us. Come reconcile us with you and with one another. God of light, open our hearts to the mystery of your love and the invitation of your grace. Let our complacency give way to conversion and our judgments to compassion for others. Turn oppression to justice and transform conflict to peaceful accord. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Our second reading this morning is from Psalm, the whole chapter. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping 
bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Please stand for the gospel reading. Today we'll be reading from the first chapter of John, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, well, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of God for the people of God. I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts assembled far and wide and yet one be acceptable unto you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Light. Light. I was reminded of that this week when I studied the first chapter of the Gospel of John, but I was also reminded of it in some other ways in conversation. And even on the evening news, you see our eldest daughter, Megan, is a teacher in Florida. And as in many occupations, teaching has had a lot of ups and downs the past year. With the pandemic, uh, there have been so many differences of approach in terms of how to keep children safe, how to help them learn and continue learning while not spreading the virus in such a dangerous fashion. There have been in-person, face-to-face, so to speak, uh, models of learning that have used masks and uh, sanitizing and distancing and other kinds of things. There have been uh, virtual models of learning where the teachers are on the computer and they communicate with students that way and have assignments submitted online. There have been, quote, hybrid models where students and teachers are in the same school building space a little bit of the time but spend other times on the computer. It's been a weird year. And it's not only an education, I understand that, but it is the world of our eldest daughter, Megan. And Megan is a very detailed uh, teacher. She takes her teaching seriously. She likes to be prepared. And that means that when things shift and change all the time, it can be really tough. Because the kids are in school one week, and then maybe they're not as the virus increases. Then they may have some new protocols and feel it's safe to try being back in the school for a while. And you know how that's gone in our own community. It's been 
a weird year. And it's been hard on people. And it's been hard on her and her colleagues. And I listened in, if you will, or watched a conversation on Facebook this week where she was talking with some of her colleagues about how they sort of hold on to get through the semester so they can regroup and, and try it again uh, in the new year. And what I noticed in those conversations is the phrase light at the end of the tunnel was used a lot. Hold on, there's light at the end of the tunnel. This is language I've heard a lot, not only from Meg, but from others, as folks have struggled during a tough, tough year and a tough season in pandemic, in political turmoil, and all of the other things that we face uh, this year in particular. Hold on, there's light at the end of the tunnel. When I first tried shining this light at the camera, Jacob, our video expert, told me that it really looked like the North Star on his screen. <laughs> and that set me to thinking as well, because the North Star is like a light at the end of the tunnel in that it can guide. Of course, in my research on the Underground Railroad and the anti-slavery movement, I know, as many of you know, the way in which the North Star became a kind of navigating uh, guide, an object that took people through danger on their journey to freedom. Hold on, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Hold on, there's the North Star. Of course, we can imagine as well the Star of Bethlehem and how it guided the Magi toward the baby Jesus in the days, weeks, months following his birth. Hold on. But then Meg used another phrase that got me thinking even more, and it was not just seeing a light at the end of the tunnel or moving toward that in hope, maybe in, in tiredness too, <laughs> trying to get there, but carrying the light with you as you go. And I want to simply drop that image, which is a little bit different. I'll return to that in a few moments. This third Sunday in Advent, we shift from the Gospel of Mark to the Gospel of John. We do a little bouncing around in the, the three of the four Gospels anyway during this year in Advent. Next week, we'll actually look at Luke. But today we're in John, and the theme of light is very prominent in the Gospel of John. The light shone in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome the light. And early on, the gospel writer speaks of Jesus Christ as the light coming into the world. In fact, not only does the gospel writer speak of Jesus Christ being the light, the gospel writer talks about the mission and vocation of John the Baptist in a way that is related to the identity of Jesus Christ, the light. What do I mean? In the other Gospels, when you read about John the Baptist, the emphasis is on his preaching. Prepare the way. Get ready. Make the roads straight. Bring the mountains low. Make a path. Get ready. And that theme is also in the Gospel of John. But in the Gospel of John, there is another theme, and it is the way in which John bears witness to the light which is Christ. It's John's own signature twist on the story of John the Baptist. And John, the gospel writer, says, this fellow, the Baptist, or the baptizer, was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. And so the identity of John that is so much in question becomes a matter not only of saying, who are you? Becomes a matter of saying, if you're not the Messiah, then, then who is the Messiah? 
And John tells his questioners that he is not worthy to untie the thong of the Messiah's sandal. John is always secondary. Not the light, but the one who bears witness to the light. What does it mean for Jesus to be the light come into the world? What does it mean to bear witness to that light? These are our questions today. And in the gospel according to John, there are some critical terms that might get missed. And yet if we pause and we take a closer look at them, they help us to understand John's particular ministry in bearing witness to the light. And I suggest they also give us guidance in how we can be witnesses to the light. First, I notice that John is called one who is sent from God. This might not strike us as an unusual phrase, being sent by God. You would think somebody who is as prophetic and unique and kind of cranky and spiritual and critical of the worldly ways, that of course he would be sent by God. But the word that is used, the Greek word, is a word that is related to the term apostle. We might think of an apostle as simply a disciple, but a disciple is a follower who may be an apostle, but an apostle is always one sent from God. The apostle Paul, one sent from God, though not a, strictly speaking, original disciple. John is sent from God for a unique mission, and it is not to make himself the light or the limelight or to stand in the limelight, but to bear witness to Jesus the Messiah. And the second word is the way in which John is a witness. And the term here that is translated as witness is drawn from the Greek marturian, meaning martyr. Again, we might think of a martyr as one of these brave Christians who would rather suffer and take the consequences of all the world's hatred instead of forsaking God. And that is true. We may think of a martyr as someone who stands up for the truth and the right of the gospel and then suffers the consequences of martyr. But in a very technical sense, in the Greek New Testament, a martyr is a witness, someone who sees. And in order to see, folks, you need light. Light. So we have one sent from God who is sent to bear witness to the light. And I suggest one who also sees truth because of the light. John is not the light. And this is a cautionary tale because so many people who claim to speak for God often become the center of attention and are set up as idols or make themselves idols, make themselves the issue. In today's language, though, we might say of John, it's not about him. It's about Jesus. And the brilliance, if you will, of John is that he points away from himself to the Messiah and bears witness to that as the light of God in Christ come to the world. Don't make the secondary character, the messenger, the prophet even, the issue. And don't worship the people who are often all too willing to become the center of attention. A mark of authenticity is the ability to reflect and refract away from the self so that Christ becomes the issue. 
But I'm still thinking about this notion of carrying the light. Not just looking toward it, moving toward it, but having it as being a, a divine gift with you that helps you see. Outside of the self, but with you, helping you see. It reminds me of a story from Liz and my honeymoon experience. This is a perfectly appropriate story. We love to camp. And so, as many know, when we took our honeymoon, we packed up the car with a tent and some equipment, and we drove out to New York State and ended up in Vermont. Now, we're really very detail-oriented people who plan a lot. So this whole trip was a bit out of character for us because we didn't know exactly where we were going. I know people say they want to take those kinds of trips. Oftentimes when they do, they end up having uh, rather interesting and unfortunate experiences because they didn't plan ahead. And we opened ourselves to this possibility, but we really had a great time. And we camped in some state parks, and we hiked, and we saw some historic sites. And I must admit, the only time we may have regretted not having everything planned out and nailed down was about the middle of the week, as we were driving up through the Adirondack Mountains late one day in a thunderstorm, and we were looking for a place to camp. Of course, looking to the prospect of camping in a, in a rainstorm wasn't the greatest, but we were looking and we couldn't find a place. And finally, after uh, attempting to enter Vermont from a couple of different places, we thought it was so late in the evening that we would simply stop at a modest hotel because after all, we could get a shower <laughs> and we could then get a good night's sleep, right? We couldn't find a place to stay to save our necks. <laughs> and finally, Liz got so desperate, if you want to use that term, that she sort of looked in her phone, not just, you know, room availability in this town, Vermont, or room availability that town, but hotel rooms available in Vermont thinking we might have to drive quite a distance. Well, we did find a place that wasn't too many miles away, maybe another hour's drive. And as it was getting close to midnight, we finally pulled into a place in Rutland, Vermont. Just one of the chain motels. And we checked in. And it was a very, very dark night. And we were tired. And if there was a moment when we maybe thought we should have planned ahead, that was the time. But we got to our room and fell asleep. And when we woke up in the morning, we went outside to pack the car and looked around. And there were beautiful mountains all around us in that town. We had no idea. You see, it's funny. When it's dark, you don't see the mountains. <laughs> and in the light of day, we saw some beautiful things. So much so that we drove up into the mountains and spent the next two or three days in one of the state parks in a beautiful, beautiful place. How critical it was to have that light to show us the way. Not only to move toward a light, but to have it with us showing the way. And this week, I learned an important lesson in a spiritual sense that I think demonstrates the way in which God can help us see things in a new light, too. I made some telephone calls this week. Uh, one of them was to one of our local assisted living facilities and, and places of residence because 
we as a church try to reach out and there are some folks who work very hard and try to reach out and in one particular place there are two or three folks from the church who once a month go to visit and it's not a large uh, gathering that gets together but maybe uh, two or three people from the church and another two or three people from the uh, facility and we were prepared to wear masks, of course, and to be distanced appropriately. And I telephoned ahead and I said, would it be okay if we come out? We had gone several months without visiting, but we had also visited um, once or twice before with masks in the pandemic, being careful. I had an interesting and really powerful conversation with the person who is in charge of that facility. I said, would it be okay if we came out? We'll wear masks. She said, well, yes. Now you would have to distance. Uh, yeah, we, we certainly understand that. And we would use the larger room so you could be far apart. Yes, we, we understand that. And then finally I asked, are we really supposed to be doing this? And she, who is a kind-hearted person, said, technically, no. And I paused, and she said, technically, no, but I know you're very careful, and I didn't have a problem the other few times. Well, at that point, I felt the need to say, gee, we're sorry about that. We didn't mean to impose our will uh, for our group in a way that was against policy. And then I began to talk to her about the pandemic and as the story unfolded, I found out that she was up against it in trying to keep people safe there. And she had cooked Thanksgiving turkey and had split it up, or I don't know how many turkeys, for the residents of the facility. Of course, it meant taking uh, the trays down one by one to the rooms, but she wanted to give them all something special they could eat in their own uh, private apartments and be safe. She was working hard to keep folks safe in a tough time. And as we talked, she then shared that one of the closest friends that she had in the entire world died from COVID-19 around Thanksgiving. So here was somebody in charge of the safety and security of about 20 people being kind and flexible, going above the call of duty to make some things special for the residents, who is also grieving the loss of a very close friend who had recently died in the pandemic. You see, when she first told me that perhaps we shouldn't go there, I have to admit that my first impulse was to think, oh, gee. Look at another thing we can't do in the pandemic. And I felt convicted about that. And I do believe God spoke to me. Because as I spoke to her, I started to become aware that this was an opportunity not to focus on what we can't do, but to focus on what we can do. And so some of us have resolved to reach out in the next week or two in a way that at least offers some kind of safe and appropriate um, modest gift or care package or something for all 20 of the residents. That sister deserves our support. Not pressure, not bad attitudes, not regrets that we can't get what we wanted to get, she deserves our compassion and our support. And you know what? We discovered a new way to serve. And we will be doing that. This third Sunday in Advent, I want to suggest that that was a moment when I saw something in a new light. You see? In a new light. Not just as the light at the end of the tunnel, not just as a goal, 
Not even as a North Star, as good as those things are. But I saw things in a new light, an opportunity to serve that I hadn't considered before. It's something that I could have done before, and maybe in my own heart it's something that I should have done before. But it took this long for it to get through my thick skull that this is something we can do, even though there are other things we can't. So homework assignment this week, folks. In the midst of pandemic and disappointment and thoughts about what can't happen this year, what won't happen this year, think about one thing, at least one thing that can happen, maybe that hasn't happened, maybe that should have happened, but that now can happen. Challenge yourself to see this season in a new light and take hold. Amen. I'd like to share uh, several items of prayer and prayer concern. I know they're not exhaustive, but this will help us to be aware of how folks are doing. We had a couple of folks who had surgery this week. Uh, Mickey Welsey had surgery this week. Uh, it was something that she had planned to have uh, attended to, and then it had been canceled and so forth. So it was uh, something of some anxiety and concern for her. But she was able to have the surgery, and she did very well, and is at home now recovering. So that's good news. Ada Springsteen had surgery this week, <coughs> excuse me, on her shoulder. And I uh, just talked with her the other day. She's got uh, significant pain following the surgery, but as I understand things, when as planned, and uh, hopefully uh, through the process of recovery, uh, she'll be better. Dave Briegel is still battling COVID. Uh, Dave was in the hospital in Borges in Kalamazoo, so we want to keep praying for Dave. Carol Herter had spent some time in the hospital uh, because of some medication that needed to be adjusted and she had some struggle with her mobility and so forth. Now Carol is in Baton Harbor at a rehabilitation facility working on her walking and her, her strengthening before she comes back home to Dwajak. Betty Knapp uh, has been struggling with COVID-19 and she was admitted last week to Lakeland Hospital for some additional treatments and some sort of extra therapies to help her. So we want to keep Betty and Mike and their family in our prayers. Shirley Leyland uh, is continuing her recovery from a broken leg and some other medical issues. She is hoping at some point to get down to Mishawaka at a rehabilitation facility. She's not able to go yet and is still at Lakeland Hospital in St. Joe. Uh, but as soon as she gets the clearance, uh, we hope that she'll be able to enter the next phase of her recovery. Adele Straub, uh, at home recovering from a broken hip, Doing very well, um, but very well through a very serious thing. Mary Jo and Bill Mercero are in continued need of our prayers. I will add a prayer request for our nation as we continue to wrestle with the, the division in our land and most especially our health care situation through the pandemic. Hoping, of course, that the uh, vaccine and vaccine possibilities the next month or two might represent, yes, a light at the end of the tunnel. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you've blessed us, even the times that may not seem at first to be blessings. Guide us, move us, 
that we may be in ministry with those we have named, trusting that you are with them all the time. Holy God, we ask that you move us, that we may consider things in new light and see the opportunities to love and serve. We ask all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, your Son, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. Let us listen now to Scott as he shares his gifts with us.
Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Please go ahead and sing along. Can't go wrong with Charles Wesley. <laughs> Live boldly with joy, even this season. And may the God of light, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abide with you forever. Amen.